So what we're going to talk about this evening is the power in the triangles. It is chapter 15 of your books. The power in the triangles, the Lord of the world. Our world is governed by a spiritual king, one of the lords of the flame who came long ago from Venus. He is called by the Hindus Sanat Kumara, the last word being a title meaning prince or ruler. Other names given to him are the one initiator, the one without a second, the eternal youth of 16 summers, and often we speak of him as the lord of the world. He is the supreme ruler. In his hand and within his actual aura lies the whole of his planet. He represents the Logos as far as this world is concerned and directs the whole of its evolution not that of humanity alone, but also the evolution of the devas, the nature spirits, and all other creatures connected with the earth. He, he is, of course, entirely distinct from the great entity called the spirit of the earth. The spirit of the earth who uses our world as a physical body. In his mind, he holds the whole plan of evolution at some high level of which we know nothing. He is the force which drives the whole world machine, the embodiment of the divine will on this planet, and strength, courage, decision, perseverance, and all similar characteristics, when they show themselves down here in the lives of men, are reflections from him. His consciousness is of so extended a nature that it comprehends at once all the life on our globe. In his hands are the powers of cyclic destruction, for he wields fohat in its higher forms and can deal directly with cosmic forces outside our chain. His work is probably usually connected with humanity and mass rather than with individuals. But when he does influence any single person, we are told that it is through the atma and not through the ego that his influence is brought to bear. At a certain point in the progress of an aspirant on the path, he is formally presented to the Lord of the world. And those who have thus met him face to face speak of him as in appearance a handsome youth, dignified, benignant, beyond all description, yet with a mien of omniscient, inscrutable majesty, conveying such a sense of resistless power that some have found themselves unable to bear his gaze and have veiled their faces in awe. Thus, for example, did the great founder of the Theosophical Society, Madame Blavatsky. One who has had this experience can never forget it, nor can he ever thereafter doubt that. However terrible the sin and sorrow on earth may be, all things are somehow working together for the eventual good of all, and humanity is being steadily guided toward its final goal. During each world period, we are told, there are three successive lords of the world, and the present holder of the office is already the third. He resides with his three pupils in an oasis in the Gobi Desert called Shambhala, often spoken of as the sacred island in remembrance of the time when it was an island in the Central Asian Sea. These four greatest of the adepts are often called the children of the fire mist, since they belong to an evolution different from ours. Their bodies, though human in appearance, differ widely from ours in constitution, being rather garments assumed for convenience than bodies in the ordinary sense since they are artificial and their particles do not change as do those of the human frame. They require no nourishment and remain unchanged through thousands of years. The three pupils who stand at the level of the Buddha and are called Pratyeka or Pacheka Buddhas assist the Lord in his work and are themselves destined to be our three lords of the world when humanity is occupying the planet Mercury. Once in every seven years, the Lord of the World conducts at Shambhala a great ceremony somewhat similar to the Wisak event, but on a still grander scale and of a different type, 
when all the adepts and even some initiates below that grade are invited and have thus an opportunity to come into touch with their great leader. At other times he deals only with the heads of the official hierarchy except when for special reasons he summons others to his presence. One of the things that we notice about this teaching is we determine how fast we want to go on the path, how much we will accelerate, how strict we will be with the teachings we have received, or how lenient. So the sky is the limit in terms of how and when we want to accelerate. And so there is this wide sense of free will in these teachings. The exalted position of this our spiritual king has been described in the secret doctrine. It is there stated that as the ages pass, the great steps which we now recognize as leading to perfection will remain unchanged as to their relative positions, though the system of things as a whole is moving upwards, and thus the actual attainments, which in the remote future will mark a particular step, will be far fuller than they are at present. The perfected men of the seventh round of our chain will be, it is said, but one removed from the root base of their hierarchy, the highest on earth and our terrestrial chain. That is to say, the king stands even now one stage beyond the point to which only ages of evolution will bring the perfected men of our humanity, ages that must run into millions of years, taking us through two and a half rounds of varied experience. This wondrous being came during the third race period to take charge of the earth evolution. That coming of the world's future king is thus described in man whence how and whither. The great Lemurian polar star was still perfect, and the huge crescent still stretched along the equator, including Madagascar. The sea which occupied what is now called the Gobi Desert still broke against the rocky barriers of the northern Himalayan slopes, and all was being prepared for the history of the earth, the coming of the lords of the flame. The lords of the moon and the Manu of the third root race had done all that was possible to bring men up to the point at which the germ of mind could be quickened and the descent of the ego could be made. All the laggards had been pushed on. There were no more in the animal ranks capable of rising into man. The door against further immigrants into the human kingdom from the animal was shut only when no more were in sight, nor would be capable of reaching it without a repetition of the tremendous impulse given only once in the evolution of a scheme at its midmost point. I find that this is a very complex writing, but we'll bear through it and extract what we're able to take. A great astrological event when a very special occurred and the magnetic condition of the earth was the most favorable possible was chosen at the time. It was about six and a half million years ago. Nothing more remained to be done save only what they could do. Then with the mighty roar of swift descent from incalculable heights Surrounded by blazing masses of fire, which filled the sky with shooting tongues of flame, flashed through the aerial spaces the chariot of the sons of the fire, the lords of the flame from Venus. It halted, hovering over the white island, which lay smiling in the bosom of the Gobi Sea. Green was it, and radiant with masses of fragrant, many-colored blossoms, earth offering her best and fairest, to welcome her coming king. There he stood, the youth of 16 summers, Sanat Kumara, the eternal virgin youth, the new ruler of earth come to his kingdom, his pupils, the three Kumaras with him, his helpers around him. Thirty mighty beings were there, great beyond earth's reckoning. Though in graded order, clothed in the glorious bodies they had created by Kriya Shakti, the first occult hierarchy branches of the one spreading banyan tree 
the nursery of future adepts, the center of all occult life. Their dwelling place was and is the imperishable sacred land on which ever shines down the blazing star, the symbol of Earth's monarch, the changeless pole round which the life of our Earth is ever spinning. Madame Lavatsky says in The Secret Doctrine, the being just referred to who has to remain nameless is the tree from which in subsequent ages all the great historically known sages and hierophants such as the Rishi, Kapila, Hermes, Enoch, Orpheus, etc., have branched off. As objective man, he is the mysterious to the profane, the ever invisible, yet ever present personage, about whom legends are rife in the past, especially among the occultists and the students of the sacred science. It is he who changes form, yet remains ever the same. And it is he again who holds spiritual sway over the initiated adepts throughout the whole world. He is, as said, the nameless one who has so many names and yet whose names and whose very nature are unknown. He is the initiator called the great sacrifice. For sitting at the threshold of light, he looks into it from within the circle of darkness, which he will not cross nor will he quit his post to the last day of this life cycle. Why does the solitary watcher remain at his self-chosen post? Why does he sit by the fountain of primeval wisdom, of which he drinks no longer? For he has naught to learn which he does not know, I neither on this earth nor in its heaven. Because the lonely, sore-footed pilgrims on their journey back to their home are never sure to the last moment of not losing their way in this limitless desert of illusion and matter called earth life because he would fain show the way to that region of freedom and light from which he is a voluntary exile himself to every prisoner who has succeeded in liberating himself from the bonds of flesh and illusion because in short he has sacrificed himself for the sake of mankind though but a few elect may profit by the great sacrifice. It is under the direct, silent guidance of this Maha Guru that all the other less divine teachers and instructors of mankind became, from the first awakening of human consciousness, the guides of early humanity. It is through these sons of God that infant humanity learned its first notions of all the arts and sciences, as well as of spiritual knowledge, and it is they who laid the first foundation stone of those ancient civilizations that so sorely puzzle our modern generation of students and scholars. It is on the first ray that the greatest progress for man is possible within the hierarchy of our globe, for there are on it two initiations be beyond that of Manu. When I read this first sentence, I found myself feeling the very strong ray from El Moria for me to elaborate for you why the first ray is that which gives us the greatest progress. And it says that for man is possible within the hierarchy of our globe. So I think that we are extremely privileged to be in the lineage of the first ray masters, Lanello and El Moria being closest to us, and then going on beyond beings with whom we have conscious contact, yet who are there. What is wonderful about the, the first ray is that it is a grid, just like you would have a grid that where the heat comes up in your house. It's a grid that goes both ways, north, south, and east, west. And it is a grid that holds the law in our beings, tethers us to the law within our beings. And the tethering to the law makes us be able to hang on to that law, to stick with it, to walk with it, almost as though we did not know the way and we were blind and we had to follow this grid or this path there is empowerment, there is a lot of energy, 
There is the opportunity to atone for the misuse of the throat chakra and all chakras. It establishes our connection to the will of God, to the Darjeeling masters, and to masters whose names we hear but we don't identify with. So I know that perhaps before we went through our, our psychology seminar, we may have thought to avoid El Moria. It's never wise to do so. He accelerates us faster than any other master. He gets us where we're going. If he disciplines us, it is with the most tender and loving embrace, with the kindest of hearts. Yet he means business, and he expects us to come into line immediately. You can't have all the power that El Moria has and not have a very soft and tender heart. It is simply necessary if you're going to carry that much power. So in looking at El Moria and thinking of him as a stern master, if you think of him as a stern master, it is really not what he is all about. He, he's just that no-nonsense guru that says, look, I'm here. You don't know how long I'm going to be here. I can take you where you have to go, and I can do it faster than any other master. That's what he says. And if we're so timid and so fearful that somehow we're going to get bruised or beaten by him, we've missed the point. We've missed the whole point. We want to be bruised and beaten by him. We want to be pummeled. We want to come in to our highest manifestation, and we're willing to be chastened. And if we don't move along with the saying of the apostle, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son that he receiveth. So El Moria has shown me all the different stages of, of planetary evolutions where people were flagellated, where they were, went to the stake, where uh, they were burned, and all kinds of terrible things have come down upon us over the ages. We survived them. We balanced karma by going through them. We got toughened. And we're here back again, ready to get in that arena. I think it would be the greatest shame of all if any of us in this community and those throughout the world who have this teaching do not take advantage of being in the presence of El Moria and making their ascension by doing whatever he wants us to do. So I think that El Moria and Lanello took me and pummeled me and were after me night and day. It was a rigorous training. And the training, I kept saying to myself, when am I going to be trained to be a messenger? <laughs> because that's what I came for. And so all the while, I'm being pummeled. I'm, they're being strict with me. They're making me do this. They're making me do that. You know, all, all kinds of um, challenges and, and things that um, I had to do, which maybe were unexpected, uh, were not necessarily what I was thinking was going to happen at that moment. All kinds of things to make me flexible, to make me ready, on the spot at any time, if I should have to change my entire direction and do something else, because that's what El Mori wants to do right now. That's what Lanella wants to do right now. So I think it is the highest privilege of all to be chastened, because it always tells us that we are loved. And if we are not chastened, then we don't get anywhere. We could be a brat, we could be selfish, we could one day think we're gods and the next day we're something else. We can go strutting around and saying, well, you know, here I am, this Chila of El Moria, so I can just do anything. So when the day finally came that I was to deliver this dictation, I think uh, I've mentioned this to you, if not in these meetings and others, that it, we had come home from a, a, a conference, a quarterly conference at the Dodge House, and El Moria said, St. Germain said, okay, this is the day that you are going to take your dictation publicly before these people who've gathered from Minneapolis and other places. And so I'm thinking to myself, this is about 98% preparation. That is not, doesn't have anything to do with being a messenger or taking a dictation, but it has everything to do that I've passed my tests and I've been obedient. 
I didn't always pass my tests, and I wasn't always obedient, but I got to the place where I balanced the karma for not being obedient. <laughs> That's the truth. I can remember going for certain periods of time, and some of them were pretty lengthy. And I probably opened my mouth and said six words, but that was bad enough you know, to cost me so to, to have to go through all those tests all over again. So those people always say, well, you know, how do you become a messenger? I, t I always tell them, I don't know how you become a messenger. Because I really don't. Because when I stood up to take my dictation, uh, the master placed his electronics presence over me, and I opened my mouth and I gave a dictation. So to this day, I still don't know how to take a dictation. I just put myself in position and obey all the rules that my mentors have taught me. So I think that it is wise to realize that all of your striving, all of your serving, all of your giving everything you have to the Ascended Masters comes down to the point when you will face a very major initiation in your lifetime. And that whether you've read the scriptures or the dictations or listened to the teachings, it's like you're solo now. And you have to do this thing that God has assigned you to do. And you have to have long ago dealt with any thought of disobedience, any thought of being out of line, any thought of anything but walking a path to become a perfected chila. So what we see on the path of students is when we have very new students or young, younger people in their teens or even in grade school, when you see them, the masters are more lenient with them because they're newly on the path and they don't know what to expect and the chastening might be too hard on them. But not a lot of time goes by before there is much ex ex expected of them also. And so I think we need to have the co-measurement of, of what it means to go from a being that is not whole and that is mutable as we are in our souls and in our bodies to that place of being totally whole where we manifest our immortality. So I think, it's, it's my studied opinion if I could make these remarks about chilas that I see, is I don't really think you understand how you can get demerits very quickly. So I could spend a lot of time just walking among you, talking to you. Maybe, um, maybe I can find the time to, to uh, see all of you at lunch or at dinner at various times. But I think that what we're missing in all the, the gifts of God that are given to us is harmony, is love. Love is the fulfilling of the law. Uh, when we speak unkindly to one another, when we have thoughts that are jagged about people, we're being very sloppy. And we're losing a tremendous opportunity to move with El Moria, to move with an ascended master day after day. So I can only reiterate you, to you again and again how strict El Moria was with me in my training in that period from 1961 till 1973 when it was time for Mark to leave. And if you think you can get away with evil thoughts or swearing or um, gossip or putting people down or all the kinds of human nonsense that we just babble on, we yak about stuff, it isn't kind, it serves no purpose, we're wasting the energy of the throat chakra. All of these little things, if you think about them and you put them all together, you begin to realize that you're really not where you should be on the path. No one should have to tell you or correct you. You should know yourself when you're out of line. Um, when you take exception because a fellow chila has some advice to offer you and you're too proud to receive it, all kinds of things like this irritability, which is in one of the chapters of this book, I think we overlook the fact that these are the things of which 
immortal beings are made. We will become immortal because we are fastidious with the details of our mind. It was about um, during the, the last July conference, and especially then and, and some months earlier, I really took a good look at myself and I decided that I was talking too much. Uh, by the way, drinking coffee makes you chatter and talk too much, and uh, it definitely steals your time. It just has that effect on people. It's well known macrobiotically. So I decided that I wasn't going to say or think anything that would compromise my godhood, my becoming an ascended master. And I cannot tell you, it's at least been a thousand times where I was about to say something to someone and then I said to myself, no, this is not going to help this person. This is not going to further their path. There is no reason for, for chattering about this subject. It's meaningless. Or it was just something that was private that shouldn't be discussed. And so I'd almost have my mouth open, ready to make a comment or a remark. And then, then I would say to myself, but this is not what the Masters and the Path is teaching us. This is what we know, and we've known it for a long time. We're just not realizing it, that crossing the line of criticism, condemnation, and judgment, crossing the line of saying, well, this person's better than that person, and all these kinds of things, we are paying a price. We will pay a price every day of our lives that we think unkindly and do unkind things. That was one of the reasons I wanted us to go through the Eightfold Path of Four Noble Truths, because Leadbeater has such a wonderful way of explaining them and really bring, bringing it down to earth. That if we are thinking these things and doing these things, we are making karma. You can make karma of the throat chakra. People who die of, of cancer of the throat usually die from drinking or smoking. But we can lose our light in our throat chakra by the unkind things we say. And so it is better to be silent and project tremendous love to people. When people do wrong and, and they are light bearers, they are profoundly grieved. They are sorry. They write to me. They ask for penances. They know they've done wrong. And they quickly want to have that penance to be restored to that level of grace. So I think it's time to be fastidious about your thoughts and your feelings, desires. What, what you do in the physical octave and what you do with the physical body in terms of what do you put into it that makes you dense or scattered or this or that. You know, are, you, are you eating the foods that are supporting your mission and supporting you where you are being very astute and very careful, where your mind is really sharp? I mean, the mind has to be sharp to catch the demons, the devils, the fallen ones that come and will attack us until the hour of our ascension. So I think that you are bigger than you think you are. You have this glorious presence of your Holy Christ Self around you, and yet you lose that real intimacy by these unkind words, by these deeds, by the harshness, by all the things that I'm sure you can name. So we get farther and farther apart from our Holy Christ Self and more and more into the human thing of that horizontal human interaction, forgetting that the most powerful interaction we have is with the Ascended Masters in the next octave, our I Am Presence, the Great Central Sun, Alpha and Omega. And a wonderful thing to do that I find when I'm idling, I'm not doing something specific that's focused, especially when I can lay my head on my pillow at night and finally have no one else making demands on me or phones ringing or this is happening. And I automatically go into the gear of loving God. It's the most wonderful thing, most wonderful way to go to sleep is just to love our Father, Mother, God and keep on sending that love and have no sense of any reward, any return, just to, just to bathe in the joy and the ecstasy of loving our Father, Mother, God and feeling that connection. I remember when I came down from Alpha and Omega to try to bring home and convert the fallen angels. And 
I can remember the loss of that intimacy of my Father, Mother, God, and returning to my Father, Mother, God now and sending all of my love before me. It's like I'm, I'm sending oceans of love um, that they can walk on or be on or just be a part of their kingdom and be a part of the, the great cosmos of reality. When we know every day of our lives that we are right with God, it is such a supreme sense of satisfaction. To be able to go to bed at night, I haven't hurt anyone, I haven't injured anyone, I've loved many people, I've helped them rise to a greater sense of who they are and not feel self-condemned. And to just keep on loving, to just get this power of love flowing through you, flowing through you all the time. Whoever you're talking to, whoever you see, whoever you talk to, there isn't anyone that doesn't need love. We all need love and we, we need the reinforcement of love. So there shouldn't be any expectations from Ascended Masters. We, we are the debtors. We must serve. We must, we must uh, balance our debts. And starting with that, that flow of love can take us very, very far. So, so please have some kind of a notebook where you check off the day and say, was I kind to everyone? Did I f fulfill my job? Did I uh, not waste time, not do a lot of chattering, not get into a lot of anxiety? but walk in the sense that, that God is taking care of us and where we're, we're supposed to be in this change will unfold and we know that the doors are opening, the doors are closing, and God has a place for all of us. So I think that the most healing presence is that presence of love. And to finish the story of the, the first dictation, that was one in Holy Tree House. I think you've probably heard this a number of times. But uh, I w we were in the basement where we had our chapel, and this group of people from from Minneapolis and others who would attend the conference were there, and they they all had come to hear me give my first dictation. And so, um, now Maury was ready, Mark was ready, and all of a sudden, I'm smelling this pot of burnt potatoes on the stove upstairs. <laughs> with a very keen sense of smell. And I could hardly sit in my seat. I wanted to race upstairs, take the pot off the stove, put it in the sink, come back and take the dictation. And if I knew if I had done that, I never would have given the dictation. And I would have failed that test right then and there. But it was all I could do to, <laughs> with every breath I breathed, I was smelling these, these um, very, very well done potatoes. <laughs> and the smoke coming out of them. So I think some of us don't have the tenacity to get where we're going. If something doesn't work, you give up, but you can never give up. And, and the training I had as a messenger was basically to be prepared for any obstacle, any calamity, anything that should suddenly descend upon you, you're ready for it. If you're an indulgent person, you have to stop being indulgent. There's just no question about it because you get totally off when you're self-indulgent and self-centered. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. You, you don't make any progress on the path or hardly any. So perhaps where I'd like to hear you speak tonight when I'm finished reading this to you is for you to think about the small things that you have done that perhaps you've overlooked. And I want you to realize tonight that it's the accumulation of small things that cause you to make karma. And when you have a whole accumulation with a lot of small things, it's like you've now created a momentum, a momentum of these small things, and all of a sudden you find yourself exploding over something big. How many times have I heard in this organization since I've been here or gotten wind of people who have exploded in, in tremendous anger over God only knows what? The price you, you might have to pay for a real big explosion like that could be a reduction in your threefold flame 
or if you have been doing this for centuries, you could lose your threefold flame. I know of one case in this organization of a person who'd been a recovering alcoholic who was young, who got so furious one day that he broke the door down and then left. He lost his threefold flame. And I witnessed that, although he was miles away from me. I witnessed that. And the reason he lost his threefold flame is because he had been given chance after chance after chance over many, many lifetimes. So he finally came to the place where he could atone for his anger and deal and process that anger. But his, his, the state of his blood chemistry, his sugar, his alcohol, whatever it was, was such that he was incapable of counting to nine, walking around the block, whatever you have to do, coming back, calming down, and going to work with a violet flame. So we didn't have to dis dismiss this person. He just left, and, and he left in anger. So you never know when you are on your last chance. You never know. You can't assume it, that today isn't it. We never know when God takes the breath of life from us and we pass on to another embodiment or to our ascension. It is the unknown of our lives unless an angel has already told us the day and date, which um, obviously some people may have that, that type of perception, but I wouldn't take it as gospel because I think sometimes our own minds fabricate such things. But if you knew that the very next time you got really angry at somebody, that that was going to be the end for you, wouldn't you be more careful? And then the question is, well, how, how does any of us know when we have burned up all our chances? And this last tirade or this last anger or this last whatever is it. And we've come here because we needed our last chances. So the worst thing you can ever do is take for granted your I Am Presence, your Holy Christ Self, the Ascended Masters. And I wanted to, inter to reiterate again the fact that El Moria has friends and the Ascended Masters have friends, but they also have people that they do not like and they do not go near. And it's a fallacy to think that God loves everyone equally because that's just not way, the way the universe runs, I'm here to tell you. God may love each one of us in a different way. If we spurn him, if we curse him, if we move against him, if we're mean to his children, if we're cocky, if we're proud, if we're this, if we're that, the masters don't befriend us. Draw nigh to me, and I will draw nigh to you. If we don't draw nigh to God on a daily basis, then, then the I am presence goes higher and higher and higher, which means farther and farther and farther away from your mind, your crown chakra, and so forth. If you don't automatically have your I am presence hovering over you, that's just not an automatic state of being until you're much further advanced. You would all do well and I'm not putting anyone down, but you would all do well to assume that you have to work hard every day to have your Holy Christ Self come over your four lower bodies so that you are living, walking, moving as the Christ as you go about your business. To have that Christ presence over you requires great attainment. And this is why Jesus Christ does not take on certain people as chilas. People think they want to be the chila of Jesus. But if Jesus lets them in and allows them to try it out, as he does uh, many times, by the time they've been in his presence anywhere from 15 minutes to two hours to a day, they cannot bear to be in his presence because the power of Jesus' light is so great. He's the avatar of the Piscean Age. So we need to to be under the canopy of our Holy Christ Self. And if we can achieve union with the Holy Christ Self and sustain it and have the ability to discipline ourselves 
we may find that that Holy Christ Self may overshadow us for a day at a time, for weeks at a time, for years at a time, depending how you sustain that love flame in your heart. So that, that is how it goes with the Holy Christ Self and the I Am Presence. So again, don't take for granted the Great White Brotherhood. Their levels of discipline are high. The stakes are high for you because you and I do not have an immortal soul. We have a mortal soul. And this soul can be snuffed out or it can attain God realization. So we are in this twilight zone where we must earn our right to come back to being one with our Holy Christ Self and our I Am Presence. And when we attain that union, God decides the day and the hour of our ascension if we are to make it in this life. I think I'll conclude reading this so that we can go on. We stopped off on, it is on the first ray that the greatest progress for man is possible within the hierarchy of our globe. Have I told all of you the story about Mary Manita and her refusing to work for El Moria? Have you heard this story? I'll tell it to you now because it's, it's very important and it happens to relate to some of the remarks that were made at the seminar. Uh, Mary Manita Boos was a very wealthy woman who had a townhouse in New York, um, a house in the country in Connecticut. And um, she claimed to be Modred. I visited her estate in her house. Um, I think I've mentioned some of you I know have heard me say this, but she, she had the sheets of Godfrey and Lotus who had slept in her home. And, um, but somehow, during the course of my stay with her, it was only probably a day, and a night, as she let down her guard kind of in, and confided in me and told me that, that she had been Modred, she had been on the left-handed path. Um, she, you know, I think she was burdened and concerned about her attitudes toward um, Mark Prophet, for one. But she told me this story. It was one of the most astounding stories I've ever heard, but she told me it, it herself. It wasn't hearsay. This, this was her experience. She was on her way to Mount Shasta for the annual meeting of the I Am Movement. And she was driving across the country, and El Moria appeared to her in the front of her car, in front of the windshield. And he gave her the message, transferred that message to her, to her mind. She, she definitely got it. And his message to her was that he wanted a certain booklet created. And would she please do it? She said no, she would not do it. She was not going to do that booklet. So El Moria went away, came back again, asked her again. No, I'm not going to do it. He went away a third time and came back again and pleaded with her to publish this booklet that he wanted to have ready, whether it was for the Mount Shasta Conference or the Bridge to Freedom or the I, I don't know what it was for. But the third time that he asked her, and she said, I'm not going to do it, she was very defiant toward El Moria. I could not believe how defiant these chilas who are the 60s and 70s and 80s, how defiant they were with the masters, like they owned them, like the masters owed them something. So she refused the third time, and she said to me that El Moria spun on his heels, went in the opposite direction from her car, and he never spoke to her or approached her again as long as she lived. Now that's, that's the teaching you need to remember as to whether or not the Ascended Masters have preferences regarding chilas and regarding friends. They definitely do. And, and that's something, something to remember. I could not for the life of me, I could not for the life of me understand how the people in the I Am Movement, the people in the Bridge to Freedom, all these people I was meeting, because here I had, I'd only read the I Am books. I hadn't come in, in contact with people. I'm sure Maria kept me away from them because they're such strange people. You know, to defy the masters, I never would have been able to understand it. 
Well, the, the point that I, that I was, was making is that um, this unconditional love that we hear about, yeah. as far as I'm concerned, unconditional love was somehow made up in hippie dumb or something. I mean, there isn't any, any unconditional love. I mean, there are conditions to love. And if we withdraw our love, and if we're angry, and if we kill people, and if we do these things, you know, it, there is no unconditional love to a murderer. God may love him, but he's going to have a long penance to do it. So it's all, this all gets back to don't take the Ascended Masters for granted. What I was going to say is that uh, I think I might have told you this. I don't know why I don't, I don't make notes of what I've told you that I haven't told you. But there were all these prima donnas in the Bridge to Freedom, the I Am Movement. Um, they were in the Summit Lighthouse too. And they really were prima donnas. And so, Moria told Mark that this is the last one he was going to try, me. This was it. You know, he wasn't going to fool around with any more of these women who wouldn't do what he asked them to do. So I, I was kind of the, the, last, the last one in line. But I came from an entirely different background. I came from the background of... of um, being a nun in various embodiments, uh, working with the masters then, working with them in the Far East. I had, I had no conception except to be obedient and humble before a master, even though I did, I did make mistakes, some of my mistakes in my training. So it really was inconceivable to me, and it was not a big stumbling block for, for me because uh, I wasn't like all these women who... Um, I was, you know, 22 at the time, and most of them were in their 60s and 70s, and I, I think they thought they owned the place. I mean, I really do, and it just uh, it's just unbelievable to me. So here we are back on the first ray, and let let us remember that we are debtors, and we owe the masters. We owe them not just one, but a lot. So let's let's pay them back. Let's, let's balance our karma with the Ascended Masters. How would you like to have an Ascended Master as your friend with whom you have balanced all your karma? Isn't that a great goal? It's a wonderful thing. Otherwise, you feel like a beggar or a debtor. You know, you're still indebted to the Master because you haven't balanced your karma or balanced karma you had with him. So I really think you ought to hop over to the first ray path, get pummeled, and have it done with. <laughs> it comes to an end. It comes to an end. You just have to get through it. So the Pacheca Buddhas who stand next above the Manu have been strangely misunderstood by some writers who have described them as selfish men who refused to teach what they had learned and passed away into nirvana. It is true that these Buddhas do not teach, for they have the other work of their own ray to do, and true also that a time comes when they will leave the world, but only to carry on their glorious work elsewhere. The next step, the initiation that none can give, but each must take for himself, puts the adept on the level of the Lord of the world, an office which is held first for the shorter period of a first or second Lord on one world, and when that has been achieved for the longer responsibility of the third upon some other. Now let's ponder this teaching. The initiation that none can give, but each, month, but each one must take for himself. That means through your Christ self, you initiate yourself. It's like you become an independent being in God. You know the law and the path so well, and you've seen many initiates go on before you, and you understand what is required. The initiation that none can give, but each must take for himself. That's, those are profound words to ponder. It's almost like we become our own individual unit world, like we become our own little planet. And we run that planet, we run our state of consciousness, and this is an initiation that none can give, but each must take for himself. You have to know when you're ready to deal with the dark forces that are your equals on the dark side. You have to rise to a certain level of Christhood, of empowerment, of fearlessness, and of, of absolute trust in 
the intercession of your I am presence. And then one fine day, you know that you can pass this initiation. And so you then decide to take it yourself. That's what I get from this reading. So it puts the adept on the level of the Lord of the world, an office which is held first for the shorter period of a first or second Lord on one world, and when that has been achieved, for the longer responsibility of the third upon some other. The task of the third Lord of the world is far greater than those of the first and second Lords, because it is his duty to round off satisfactorily that period of evolution and to deliver over the countless millions of evolving creatures into the hands of the seed Manu who will be responsible for them during the interplanetary nirvana and will hand them over in turn to the root Manu of the next globe. The third lord of the world, having fulfilled this duty, takes another initiation entirely outside of our world and its hierarchy and attains the level of the silent watcher. In that capacity, he remains on guard for the whole period of a round. And it is only when the life wave has again occupied our planet and is again ready to leave it that he abandons his strange, self-imposed task and hands it over to his successor. The goal for all. Far above us, as is all the splendor of these great heights at present, it is worth our while to lift our thought towards them and try to realize them a little. They show the goal before every one of us, and the clearer our sight of it, the swifter and steadier will be our progress towards it, though we may not all hope to fulfill the ancient ideal in this and fly as an arrow to the mark. In the course of this great progress, every man will someday reach full consciousness on the highest of our planes the divine plane, and be conscious simultaneously at all levels of this prakritic cosmic plane, so that having in himself the power of the highest, he shall yet be able to comprehend and function on the very lowest and help where help is needed. That omnipotence and omnipresence surely await every one of us. And though this lower life may not be worth living for anything that we may gain from it for ourselves, yet it is magnificently worth enduring as a necessary stage for the true life that lies before us. I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither hath it entered into the heart of man to conceive the things which God has prepared for them that love him. For the love of God, the wisdom of God, the power of God, and the glory of God pass all understanding, even as does his peace. Peace to all blessings. I would like to know if any of you would like to discuss the smaller violations of the masters that you feel you might have practiced or manifested or just take for granted that it's okay to do those things when it's not. Maybe we should get down to the nitty-gritty of why we are not accelerating higher, faster. And maybe it's the little things rather than the big things. So would anyone like to speak about these? Hi, Mother. <clears throat> I wanted to share something about El Moria here that I just came to terms with, and then maybe it'll help some other folks here. Plus, I want to get down to some of those small things that I probably don't see that I'm doing. but. <clears throat> A couple of darshans ago, you were talking about um, we have to tune into getting closer to El Moria and understanding our position, so to speak. And um, I thought to myself, well, uh, I don't, I don't really feel like I have a real block there. And then I started thinking about it, and analyzing, it, and I realized that that you know, from what I, my perspective is that you know, El Moria loves me very much. And at least that's what I, I thought. But then I started looking and I thought, well, I'm treating him, I've been treating El Moria exactly the way I, I treated my own father in this lifetime for a reason. But what I was doing was I was creating a wall because my own father was, I don't know whether he was a little light or not, but it was, <clears throat> it was a difficult situation. And, and, and just right after I came to terms with this and I started thinking, 
you know, you dummy, you're been looking for this father and you've been trying to get this, this thing straightened out in your mind. And there's my father has been waiting for me to turn around and see him standing right behind me. <laughs> so it was really, it's been really just, just going through this and, and tuning into it just from one darshan. I was just be able to understand that I don't have to go looking anywhere if I just start doing the right things and turn around and, and be more attentive. Because I had to explain this. I had to sort of put a wall up a lot of times because my father was abusive in his way. So I was kind of frightened a lot of times, I suppose my soul was. And so what I'm saying is you don't have to, I don't have to do that. I have to take this wall down and, and start being more attentive to my father because he is my father. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> there was uh, one other thing I wanted to say, and it just went right out of my head. But anyway, I'll, just real quickly, uh, <clears throat> I was when I first came back on staff, I was, uh, this was just a couple of years ago here, I came back on staff. I was in the, uh, it was a conference, and I was talking to somebody uh, on, in the cafeteria, and he was telling me about something that had taken place with somebody that I had worked with before on staff, and there had been a problem and everything. And, I, and he wanted to make make me sure make sure that I understood what uh, uh, the situation, how it transpired, and whether I had personally felt any uh, discomfort in working with this individual or whatever it had transpired and everything. And, and I was listening to him; we were discussing, but I wasn't looking right at him. And I, I turned around just for a second to look at him. And what I saw was, I saw those eyes, and I saw the, <laughs> I saw the turban, the whole thing, and it was. And I suddenly knew that, for some reason, El Mori wanted to make sure that I was aware of this difficulty that had transpired, and I didn't need to uh, be concerned about it, which I really wasn't. But I guess sometimes the master wants to uh, wants to know for sure. I don't know. I guess they don't always know exactly what's going on inside here. <laughs> uh, yes, they do. Well, I, I don't know why he, he, I guess he wanted to make me feel more at ease or, or what, but. Uh, I think he wanted you to notice him and not neglect him anymore because he had things to teach you. Well, I asked you not too long back uh, here when you were visiting us at the Yellow Barn about what I needed to do to make my ascension in this lifetime. And, uh. With all the confusion and the noise at the time, I, I, I know what you said. You were talking, you missed service and so forth. But I, I suddenly thought, did I miss something? Did I not serve, give you? Serve your master. He has given himself to us. We are the beggars, not the choosers. He has decided that he's the master for us. And that's who we get. And that's who we work with. And that's, that's with whom we work through our psychology, and our burdens. If we didn't need him tremendously, El Moria would not be here because we would be taking care of ourselves. Hmm. So serve your master. He's come for you. Preach his word to the nations. Get out the books. Speak to people. Go to the teaching centers. Open your mouths and speak his message. Okay. Hi, Mother. My name is Jennifer Stillings. Um, since you're bringing up these little things that are keeping us from making progress in the path, there are several things that I can talk about. Um, I feel exactly many things that you have said are so true to me that I feel like I can accelerate so much more. But somehow I break, uh, put the brakes on and don't do it. It's like if I just don't want to go there. And I'm sure it's something in me that does that. And there's a few things, a couple things basically that um, I keep doing. There's a series of them, but one of them is um, I was reading this little booklet that El Moria has about the damage that you can do to others through CCJ. And it talks about the fact that um, when you feel or think something about somebody, it does certain damage, but when you vocalize, verbalize about it, 
it can be potentiated about 10 times. And um, I was trying to read that because sometimes I've gotten into the habit um, when things are irritating to me about somebody else, someone, to um, go to another person and just verbalize about it. Yeah, did you and know it's what ter that terrible person thing. said to me? Can you imagine what she said? You know, and then it goes on. Yeah, or um, you've, you've what these people are the doing. Spiral. Yeah, it's and like um, it. it's it's the thing that makes you feel falsely that you're better than that person. And I can see it. I can objectively see it and say that it has it has to stop. I think a lot of it it's a lack of compassion, probably. And um, also that sense of irritability and seeing the things faults in others. And I'm sure that's some kind of a version of the third eye chakra. Oh, I, I should read us back again the, the little section on irritability in here. We've all read it, haven't we? Effects of irritability. Would you like to refresh your memory on this one? <laughs> irritability is a common difficulty. That's comforting. <laughs> As I've already explained, to be irritable is a thing which is likely enough to happen to anyone living in his present civilization. Remember, this is like 1895, you know. <laughs> Where people are always very highly strung. <laughs> we live, in a, to a large extent, in a civilization of torturing noises, and above all things, noise jars the nerves and causes irritation. The experience of going down into the city and returning from feeling home feeling quite shattered and tired is a common one for sensitive people. Many other things are contributory, but principally the weariness is due to the constant noise and the pressure of so many astral bodies vibrating at different rates and all excited and disturbed by trifles. It makes it very difficult to avoid irascibility, especially for the pupil whose bodies are more highly strong and sensitive than those of the ordinary man. Of course, this petulance is somewhat super superficial. It does not penetrate deeply, but it is better to avoid even a superficial peevishness as far as possible because its effects last so much longer than we usually realize. If there is a heavy storm, it is the wind that first stirs the waves, but the waves will continue to swell long after the wind has died down. That is the effect produced on water, which is comparatively heavy, but the matter of the astral body is far finer than water, and the vibrations set going penetrate much more deeply and therefore produce a more lasting effect. Some slight, this is slight now, some slight unpleasant temporary feeling which passes out of the mind in 10 minutes perhaps may yet produce an effect on the astral body lasting for 48 hours. The vibrations do not settle down again for a considerable period of time. When such a fault as this is known, it can most effectively be removed not by focusing attention upon it, but by endeavoring to develop the opposite virtue. The opposite virtue. Think of the virtue that can antidote your irritability, whatever it is. What's the strongest virtue you feel you have to antidote it? One way of dealing with it is to set one's thought steadfastly against it, but there is no doubt that this course of action arouses opposition in the mental or astral elemental, so that often a better method is to try to develop consideration for others, based, of course, fundamentally on one's love towards them. A man who is full of love and consideration will not allow himself to, to speak or even to think irritably towards them. If the man can be filled with that idea, the same result will be attained without exciting opposition from the elementals. I was dealing with an, uh, an individual in the past week or earlier who was extremely angry and extremely vocal and extremely harsh uh, to the extent that they were so loud that even th though I had the phone to my ear, people could hear what this person was saying two rooms away. I chose to remain on the phone because I, I felt that the person was definitely not stable and regardless of the pain it was causing me, I had to hold the balance for this person because I didn't know where they were gonna, they were gonna land up. So recently, as I look back upon that event, which was a very heavy burden, I realized that it had affected my heart because there was such anger and such intensity directed at me, and I tuned into this fact that it had actually 
attacked my heart, my physical heart. So I realized that, first of all, many people put on tantrums and things like that um, because they just want to make a statement, they want to be loud, they want to be heard, they want to yell, whatever it is. And <clears throat> we've learned some, some very good ways of speaking to one another when people start that yelling, and that was demonstrated another, many times in this seminar. Um, I really couldn't answer the question that I asked myself, why in the world did you stay on the phone and allow this horrendous energy to keep on going and keep on going? And as I said, it was because I was concerned for the person. But if you own the book Heart, you should read that book because in it, El Moria talks about how the vibrations that are around the heart must be guarded. The heart must be guarded. And it's a, the whole book about heart is very valuable. And I thought I'd go back and read it myself. But we really can't allow people to do this. And I came to the conclusion, and I have so, you know, in the past many, many times, that if people threaten suicide, this person was not threatening suicide, but when and if they do, and they do it continually, you finally have to say then, okay, you know, it's your life. If you're going to commit suicide, I'm not going to help you. So please guard your heart and maybe review the book Heart. I think you'll get a lot from it. I think that if you have one very important goal in your life, one great passion, one great focus, that you see the beginning or the end from the beginning, that you'll lose yourself in the joy of the fulfillment of this, this passion and this joy of what you're contributing to the universe. So you get away from the pettiness of thinking about how you said this, how somebody said that, what you thought they thought. It's really a waste of time. It's the same old thing. You can't change people. You have to change yourself. And um, that's, that's very important. The reason I'm here is because I would like you to pummel me if possible. You pummel yourself ten times more than, than I would ever pummel you. I, I know that. But you, you're beating yourself up every day. But it doesn't work, you know. It doesn't work at all. <laughs> <laughs> and if, because it doesn't work and this process of analyzing doesn't work either, you know, I just wanted you to, to tell you that and everybody here that I would like to extend my heart to everybody, you know, to talk and so on. But at the same time, there is that selfishness. There is that selfishness. There is that even that consciousness of greed. I understand. I feel that. And I apologize myself when I go, for instance, through the line in the kitchen. I don't have patience, and I I wrestle when. You know, it, it's a consciousness that's not right, and I don't know how to get through it. You need a focus outside of yourself. You, you are turned inward and magnifying as if you were, you know, this huge magnifying glass upon yourself. You, you need a, a, a calling and a cause out here that, that you live for night and day, and you lose yourself in giving yourself to that cause and God returns you again to a higher state of being. You are too inward. I see you walking around. You're mostly bent over. You don't have the sense of the presence of God in you because you're constantly um, destroying yourself with your negation. You, have to, you just have to stop it. You could, you could, you could become diseased by yeah. carrying on this attitude. Some cause, the greatest cause you can think of, that you would like to go out and espouse and do, you have to lose yourself in that service. And one fine day you wake up and realize that you have transcended your self-condemnation and all your other selves. And you have come to a new dimension of sacrificial love that is the most fulfilling love you can find anywhere on earth sacrificial love. Just get, keep on giving. Keep your eye on the children you're caring for, on the disabled, the blind, the this, the that. I used to go looking when I was, before I was 10 or 8 years old, I'd ask my, 
my Sunday school teachers, you know, do we have any six people around? Can I go visit them? Can I go read to them? And so they, they, they took me around so that I could do it. I had this sense I had to go and help people who were sick. It's very rewarding. I think the, our biggest problem is this introspection. Yes. Don't, don't you get tired of thinking about yourself? I thought, yeah, it's just awful. It's true. But I, you know, I like to help people. I like to, to spread the teachings. But, you know. What's the but? But. Yeah, what's the but? I like to do this, but what's your but? Well, well, you know, I don't, I don't know if I have the the level to do that, or if it is the will of God that I will do that, or you just, know, just go do it, just go do anything. It doesn't matter what. Okay. If you engage in something, it leads you to the next thing. Okay. And it leads you to the next thing and the next thing. If you do nothing, nothing ever happens. And you still you keep going inward. You have the greatest opportunity you've had in thousands of years to make your ascension. Now I want you to do it. Can you consider that I can, I'm able to to find that passion here in the community and have a job to do it? You have to know it. Only you can tell what your passion is. I can't tell you. Something that sets you on fire. Either you set on fire because you want to, you want to join. A, a right to life situation, or you want to go help children who are very uh, badly handicapped, whatever it is, you have to find it. Lose yourself in the service of God. Beloved Mother, um, the thing that concerns me most in my life is procrastination in the sense that. I know that it's been said that procrastination can be the death of the soul. And um, at times I've really been concerned about my soul. And it's, it's a very subtle thing. It's like there's such momentum about it <clears throat> that um, you don't even realize you're doing it until there's a great pile of stuff behind you that you haven't done, that I haven't done, and then it becomes overwhelming. And at that point, it's like, I know this, it's like a momentum from childhood of a pretty chaotic childhood and not completing cycles. And I'm, I'm working with my inner child on this process of healing. I really feel strongly about the sense of not having a mother or a father in this life. I have physically, but so uh, chaotic that um, it, it's really inner. It, it, it's taken me a while to trust you as mother, if you understand what I mean. And yet it's like... Um, it's very easy for anyone who ha has had serious mother problems to project that bad mother on me. I don't I, want to do that. It's, it's all right, I understand it. But I just wanted to say that it's very hard for me to interact with people who don't resolve the mother issue. You gave me, over, over this seminar, you filled me with such great love and compassion. It was, you know, just your glance, just your, your look into my eyes. And it's like I felt profoundly safe. That's wonderful. And um, all I want to do is serve you and El Moria and the path. Um, you, want, you want a key? Yes. I can give you a key. Yes. When you think of it, do it. Because that's Moria. Put it up on your mirror. Do it. Put it someplace where you see. When you think of it, do it. You know why? Because he is the su supreme astrologer. And if you move with his timetable, oh, yeah. you will always be in sync 
with the planets, the stars, and what is the best possible moment for the action you want to take. That is why procrastination is the bane of our existence. Wait five minutes, wait 15 minutes. It's devastating. Well, we have to stop it. Yeah. We can't be the victims of our mother or female personalities or male or whatever it is. But the amazing thing that, um, that happened in my birth is, is the story of this doctor who the day before was a Friday. He went to my father's boat yard and said, you know, I, I want you to design me a boat. I want you to build me a boat. And so, you know, my father got out the plans and showed him the whole thing. And uh, then my father said to him, do you think you could help my wife? She's having a problem delivering our child. And uh, some doctor was using some antiquated methods to, uh, to attempt to um, produce this birth, but it wasn't happening. So this doctor said, sure, I can help you. I'll be over there tomorrow morning at, well, it was like 10.30. Uh, it was some, somewhere about 10.30 in the morning, 10 o'clock in the morning. I'll, I'll go to the hospital, and I'll do a C-section. That's exactly what he did. And I know that El Mori engineered the whole thing because he wanted me to be born at a certain exact time. And I will never forget that, that Moria went to that trouble mm -hmm. to have this man decide right then and there that he wanted to buy a boat for my father and that my father brings up th this case. And uh, I'm convinced that if that scene had not happened, that I probably would have been born at the wrong time. Right. Through waiting around and waiting around for this birth to take place. So when I hear El Moria, if I don't do it now, I know that if I wait five minutes, I'm already off center of the right timing. That's what I feel, you know, so often. It's like just that little bit out of sync. But, but you know what we heard? We heard people say at this um, seminar that they have trouble doing things that they're supposed to do when you're saying the same thing. Uh, is it because of, of a nagging mother that, you know, she's nagged you so long, you know, you know you're moving in the opposite direction, you won't do what she tells you to do just because you have to maintain your own identity? Yeah. So that, that's very dangerous if we have to move, if we have to fight with someone who is making us procrastinate. So we, we don't want to go down that path. And so in order to be accurate in timetables, you have to be listening. A part of you, a part of the listening ear, you don't need to even use the whole ear, but a part of your listening ear is always listening for the master's voice. And so your whole mind and being and emotions are not totally occupied or preoccupied with whatever you're doing. Mm -hmm. We have to listen. And if I may just ask one, quick, one other quick thing. Is there a difference between passion and dharma? Or are they the same? The passion is the fire that ignites the Dharma. That's Mori's quote right now. Passion is the fire that ignites the Dharma. Thank you. Thank you for asking. Thank you, Mother. We don't get things if you all don't ask. <laughs> I love you with all my heart. I love you too. Good evening, beloved Good Mother. Evening. Good evening, my dear friends. I, first of all, would like to be pummeled, and Boy, second, I'm going to have <laughs> you're going to be busy. <laughs> and second of all, it has been laid on my heart again and again this evening that, in relation to the teaching that you have given us, that it's a it's a fault not to have the gift to give. And I'm thinking about this and feeling about this repeatedly in relation to beloved Jesus' book because I feel that the book is about to come out, God willing and with God's grace, and there probably are a lot of Christians out there 
who are going to react to it one way or another. And I feel and think that I would like direction from you, from El Moria, from Jesus, about how to pray for them, how to prepare ourselves. So let's start with number one, how okay. to pray for them. How to pray for okay, them. Okay, the first thing you do is call for the binding of their dweller on the threshold that keeps them tied to their fundamentalism, their, um, their demon possession by wanting the Holy Spirit so much that they wind up getting the false hierarchy imposter of the Holy Spirit. I am not going after Christians to convert Christians. Christians need to come to the, f to the feet of the real Jesus, not their made-up Jesus. You know, they, they say to us, well, uh, your, your Jesus is different from our Jesus. <laughs> Whatever that means, I don't know. They have a, a, an image of Jesus in the likeness of themselves. They're precious people, but you know, there's a whole world of non-Christians out there that need this book. And if a Christian can't even get past reincarnation and karma, then... I just don't have the heart to chase after Christians, I have to tell you that. I just don't have the heart for it. There's just got too many demons. Next question. <laughs> well, <laughs> I happen to still have family members who are Christians. And Wonderful. Give them are... the book, talk to them about it, do whatever yeah. you want. Anybody can preach to Christians who, who, who wants to, but... There are souls that are older than Christians. Christians come into the Piscean dispensation. Some of them are no older than 2,500 years. That's the only dispensation they've been through. They've never been through Buddhism, Hinduism. So you have all these old souls on the planet I see. of the fourth root race and the fifth root race and then the sub-root races. And these people, uh, they have known the avatars of their ages who their avatars have been as they've come down through the ages. So if you're trying to bring to Christians reincarnation and karma and, and the church has never taught it to them, you're just up against a wall. Yes. So don't argue with family over religion. It's not worth it. You know, just um, do a lot of decrees for them. And you never know when someone's going to pick up a book and it's their time. It's their time to go into therapy. It's their time to suddenly realize that, yes, I've lived before. And you can't force the bud. You can't force it to flower. So we've got a whole lot of other people who are ready, waiting, waiting for Jesus, waiting for this great message. Thank you. Thank you, Francis, and everyone here for your help on the book. Mother, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. And thank you, El Moria, for the opportunity you know, to be here. You did something very naughty last Sunday night. What did I do? I was on the feed in my house. Oh. Yes, I was on the feed. And you got up in front of that um, feed when there was a break, and you started making faces at me. <laughs> <laughs> you were sticking out your tongue at me. You were behaving like a, a little elf. <laughs> so now I'm taking my revenge. <laughs> I thought the camera was off. <laughs> then why were you gesticulating if you thought the camera was off? Well, there I was. I was right smack standing, looking you right. You sure were. Yeah, I was. <laughs> <laughs> you sure were. <laughs> I was. I went through an eternity standing in line up there, listening to you speak to other people about these little things. And I was going to come up here and um, focus on just simply walking down a, a path or in the cafeteria by somebody and just saying that uh, I can remember when I first came to Camelot and I walked down the path from El the the. Uh, to the cafeteria from where we used to do all our prayers and uh, and the staff would be walking down there like this, you know, and they would never even look at me and I would say hello and they wouldn't respond. 
And then I became a staff member and I did the same thing. <laughs> What's and, your point? Well, well, the point is that I, I, ceased to be, I ceased to be in the now. I, I became, as you've pointed out here, I, I focused on inside myself and my work and my job and my karma and things I weren't doing wrong and all these different things. And um, I've been trying to stay in the now now since 1975 or 76 because I remembered at that point I, I was going nuts going to work. Do because you think it's a good idea to be in the now? I do. Why? Because then when I, when I look at you, I'm with you or with whoever I'm with. The second you look at me, the person you saw is not here because it's past. Yeah, but the, I'm not thinking of something else. I'm, I'm just where, where we I'm are. What I'm saying to you, there is no present. Oh, there is no present. The only, no, there is no present. As soon as you all got finished laughing, time passed. Of course. So there, there is, the present is an impossibility. So if we want to have time to become ascended, we have to be futurists. We have to plan for the future. We have to plan for what this organization is going to be doing, where and how and with whom. So if you don't leap into the future, into the 21st century, now, by the time you get there, it will be gone. So you have to leap into the future. When I leap into the future, then I look back at where I came from and I figure out where I'm going into the future. Because by my past, I can calculate my future. Would you look and see the vision of the future then figure out how to get there? Is that what you're saying? All the time, every day. Mm -hmm. I always do that. Well, that, I think that's more beneficial than all the books I've read, where all these gurus talking about being in the now. <laughs> This, this is really how I keep the vision for this community, for the masters, for the world, for each of us individually. And, and I, I plan for the future. I plan for what I'm going to be doing so many, so many years or decades from now, insofar as I can plan based on you know, world conditions and worry allowing me to travel and not travel. But really, um, the moment that... Um, we experience the present, the present doesn't exist. Well, walking down the path again, uh, looking at it your way, then I should be uh, very more concerned about my appearance than I am now. Because, What's your appearance got to do with it? Well, because if somebody looks at me and my appearance is not what it should be, then they get that image in their mind and I'm responsible for that image. And that's looking into the future of the negative outcome of that, from my point of view. Did you all get that? <laughs> We may have to wait till we step into your future to understand it. Well, at any rate, I, 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 um, the, I guess what I, another way of saying what I am saying here is that um, it, it boils back down to, to love for that person who you see coming down the path in whatever form. And however they are, that if you can truly project what you really feel about them, which is love, it's, it's just there. Even though you may cover it up and gloss it over or not respond to it, but you know, when I, when I see you guys, you're, I just love you. But I'm not always there to give that love to you, so forgive me for that. But if we can just be more um, looking to the future of how you will remember us once you've passed us on the path <laughs> and you get love, you just get love there. In the cafeteria line, you just get love there. You know, or however you want to look at it. That's, we just have to do it because, you know, when, when I came onto the property, I was disillusioned by these people going by me looking at the ground. What were they who doing? Who were staff people. What were they doing? They were just thinking, I suppose. They were just not there. How about you think they might have been doing mantras? Maybe some of them were, but generally not. At least I didn't hear them. 
I didn't see their lips moving. Well, that's not my recollection of my staff at Camelot. Well, that no. was my recollection of my arrival. Oh, the arrival. That's that's all I can say. But I just don't want somebody to come here to this wonderful place and find that. I mm -hmm. want them to just experience the love in our hearts. Well, to the and extent that. that we can fulfill your ideal, we will do so, Peter. Well, we'll do it. Thank We're you. We're just going to do it. Thank you so, very much. No. God love you. <laughs> Hello, Mother Hi. and everyone. I, too, want to be pummeled like everyone else here, but I get scared. And I've written letters, made calls, done lots of violet flame. What do you think is going to happen to you if I pummel you? <sighs> Tell me, what is going to happen to you? Well, hopefully I would take, take it to heart and come up higher. Well, this pummeling may not involve any verbal communication. When yeah. you think about pummeling, it, mm -hmm. it, it could be physical, it could be a spiritual, it could be, you know, whatever your need is. Actually, I felt it sometimes in your glance. I felt a lot of love in your glance, and there are other times when I felt a pummeling. And so then I can tell you what happens because I go home and I feel, I feel very sad, and then I gather myself together and I say, okay, look at what, why this happened. And so then the thoughts come to me on, on what I was thinking at the time or what, was, what the problem may have been, and I make calls on that and try Maybe not to do it. Maybe you shouldn't um, dwell on this so much. I mean, y you, could, you could misread me, you know. Yes, that's very you, possible. You shouldn't put all of your, your ideas about this interchange in whatever you've read into me, which could be farthest from my mind. Mm -hmm. But I'm not discounting my Holy Christ self. But if you're in the hands of my Holy Christ self, you're in good hands. <laughs> yes, I, I believe that. So what are we doing now? What, what would you like to talk about? I just wanted to ask if, well, if, if there's a way that I, what, what else I could do to get rid of this, this fear that's, that's in me. I really think it is fear. And I think you, you need to analyze the source of the fear and perhaps have some therapy sessions. Maybe the fear of, of the mother, the father. Um, I think that's probably it. I, I think that you have had a certain strictness in your, in your family upbringing. Um, partly old world, is that correct? Kind of, kind yes. of interactions. Mm -hmm. And uh, many of us have had that. So it's really not fair to read into one another anything because mm -hmm. uh, many of us have, have seen these, uh, seen imp our imperfect parents. And because I'm a parent figure, you, you could pr be projecting your, your mm -hmm. parent onto me, which would be very sad. I, I've thought of that too. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. You too. Good evening, Mother. Good evening. Uh, my question is about what you just told us before. Do we fastidious with our thoughts or feelings, everything we put in our bodies? And how do we balance this with, with uh, not thinking in ourselves and giving ourselves with it, the other work of being fastidious and be conscious of what you think, what you feel, what you ate. This is self-observation. -obser this is the path of the Buddha. The Buddha is al always observing himself so that he knows exactly where he is. That's what the Bodhisattva does. A part of ourself must monitor ourself and through all waking hours. And, and when we give our mantras, we carry those mantras in our sleep. So if you're not self-observing in, in, the, in the middle way, not to the point of you know, putting yourself down and all the criticism and all of that, but observing yourself uh, in a gentle way and determining if you are in that middle way of the path, that, that center, the God center of the middle way. And that's why I read to you from the end of the book the last time, so that you could realize that there is a path whereby a part of us can continuously maintain the observation of self and decide if this is worthy of keeping it or 
it should go into the violet flame because it, it is not good. So you really have to be self-observant. You can't just can't go around not thinking about what you're doing or how you're affecting people. You have to be sensitive to that. Mm-hmm. So how, how do you control your thoughts? Because uh, thoughts affect your feelings and you can control through, your, through the thoughts that, that's why I introduced the macrobiotic diet into the community. Not all people follow it. Not all people believe in it. They try other diets. Um, since I got on this diet, I, I am a changed person. And I, have, I am much more centered and much closer to God because uh, I follow this strictly because it saved my life. Because I, I, I knew I didn't have the strength to carry on with this organization and uh, to bring it to its fulfillment. So if you, you follow this diet, you will be able, able to stop like a spiral of thoughts that's gonna, gonna bring you into a karma making situation or you, you... What I think you need to do is, base, is study basic macrobiotic diet and cooking and it doesn't have to be complex. But mm-hmm. there's, there's a, a balance of foods that come together so that you have established the Tai Chi and you have the balance of the yin and the yang. So if you're too yin, your thoughts are going all over the place and you're not focused. And it, one of these chapters said you're basically useless to the brotherhood if, you're, if you can't even focus on one thing for more than a minute. And then you can be too yang where you're very uptight, easily angry, and um, very short and you know super yang it doesn't help you, it doesn't help anybody else. So it's the middle way. And the macrobiotic diet is the middle way. I called to St. Germain to give me the diet of the Eastern Adepts. He sent that diet to me, and he sent cooks to cook that diet. And I notice uh, if, if I do things that I don't normally do, and I have a wide variety of food. It's not like I'm only eating a bowl of rice, etc. I eat a wide variety of food, and uh, the less um, fowl or, or fish or, or meat, the better. I'd rather rather eat vegetarian protein. But um, I know that if I don't eat the right things, or if I eat sugar, if I do this or I do that, I am not centered, and I will not be able to deal with you or anyone's problem who's calling me in an emergency on the phone. I'm going to be off kilter. I'm not going to be centered. I know I'm not centered. I know I have to get myself back centered by doing what I do to balance the food or what I take in. So the physical vehicle is the most important vehicle you have. Treat it right, you'll live to a ripe old age, God willing. If you don't treat it right, you won't you won't be here to fulfill your mission. So uh, I, I think it's a mistake to say, well, we want this diet, we want that diet, we want this other diet. I'm your guru, this is what I eat, and I feel that my diet has helped me come to a oneness with Gautama Buddha and the Eastern adepts who have eaten this way for hundreds if not thousands of years. So, you know, if, if you think you can be in control and yet eat wrong foods, you can't. It's impossible. You're going you're gonna to get out of balance as sure as I'm sitting here. So it's, you know, we read all kinds of books. We go to movies. We do this. We do that. It's important to sit down a basic study, a basic macrobiotic book and a system where you can get a balanced meal that you can cook and that, that can really lead you on a spiritual path. I didn't just ask St. Germain for a diet. I asked him for the diet of the Eastern Adepts. That's the diet I wanted, and that's the diet he sent me. Thank you. We shouldn't be fat. You know, we should be exercising along with our diets. We can be in better shape. We don't have to stuff ourselves with food. It takes discipline. But to really have that, that intense fire that is direct, 
It's not too big, it's not too little, but it's there. And I hold that fire for you, and I can give you that fire when you need it. I feel this is my responsibility, but it's the responsibility of everyone here. If you are not in balance with God and with your Christ self, and if you're off balance, and then suddenly some calamity happens, you are ill-equipped to deal with it. And that's what happens to us when we're, we're off guard. The body is, is the most precious instrument we have, because if we lose it, we lose everything. Thank you. Good evening, Mother. Um, this question came when I heard your answer earlier this night uh, to the person who said that he had received had a difficult situation with a supervisor, and you said you just sip the lip and you just take it. And I had a similar situation just recently, not with a supervisor, but with a co-worker. And uh, it was actually interesting because the situation built up around me without me knowing it. And before I even actually knew that there was a great tension perceived by the other person about me, I had... Um, I saw Moria in my third eye, just driving to Eastgate with my car. And then um, I thought, well, what's, what is with me? Why is Moria with me? And I thought, well, maybe something with my health is going on or uh, something that's dangerous. And then five minutes later, I, I stepped into the, the office of my department head, and I found out that there was a very uh, severe accusation that was against me. And because I'm trying, I think I have had difficulties dealing with my emotional body in that situation and also in, in another situation that I'm dealing with. And um, I just want to find out more about um, how to seal this emotional aspect of the body because I feel in the astrology I've been told that I have to learn to a certain degree to stand up for myself. And uh, I feel by talking to someone who is a confidential person or even to a supervisor or a department head to clarify the situation, I feel um, a protection and a growth. Um, how, would I, how would I accomplish this if I would just say nothing? I would feel like um, I would have to bear an accusation. That's not right, or I would not really defend my inner child. No, I, I think you need to defend your inner child, and I think you need to make peace with a person and the more harmoniously you can do that, uh, the less will be the burden on you and the other person. So I do think you need to make known what, what is your position and, and bring out the misunderstanding and, and, mm -hmm. and talk to, to someone. It's very important. Um, I see a lot more people across the world than you do. So you, I probably have many more encounters than you do, and plenty of encounters that I never know exist because it's people gossiping here, it's people gossiping there, it's you know, it's just all over the world. So when I say I let it go, um, I make sure that I put it into the flame, and I make sure that I deal with uh, bad energies. And I, I think I've taught you before that um, if your ear turns bright red, that you are having gossip about you. And um, this is one thing that I will never tolerate. As soon as I get a red ear, I drop everything, get my sword, and I cut myself free until the ear is no longer red. And I speak to the person who is sending it to me because it, all, it is always a person. It's not anybody imaginary, it's a person or a group of people who are gossiping about me. So since it's not my energy, but it is theirs, I take my sword and I send it directly back to them with the full fury of my sword to let them know that I will not tolerate their encroachment on me. I think I feel many times too the vulnerability. Um, I'm not sure, you know, because a personality is really something close and it's not perfect and I know I'm not perfect and when a situation like that happens I feel also vulnerable um, to acknowledge or not only to acknowledge but to say well I really am not perfect and I may have made a mistake here but I may not have the full ability to be perfect in, in any given situation or it's um, I feel it, it, sometimes it, it, a great vulnerability um, with German pride or with with things that are being said to me that I do not really feel in my heart, but that I'm not sure about if I have them. 
so then when it's being said um, there is this German pride and I say of course there can be German pride everywhere in me but it's not really who I feel when I get up in the morning but it's it's still probably something is someone that is saying you have your German pride mm -hmm. it's ridiculous or it's, that it's totally ridiculous to make a remark like that to any any fellow Chile I would say you know if someone it's says so I, come I come across with a German pride it can block me to the extent that I really feel um, so, so shied away from even being <laughs> but then on the other side I must acknowledge probably I have some of it and then I'm then I'm ashamed about that too so <laughs> it's kind of a double bind you know, so goes the human consciousness you know you yeah. can you can deal with it all day long um, you know nobody has a right to say to somebody else in this community well you know you have your such and such pride I mean we, we all came from some an some ancestors from some country from somewhere right Unless you were born in the USA, but you had you had parents and grandparents behind you, so it's it's just ridiculous. I mean, who's been to Germany? Have you talked to ten thousand Germans and you decide now, yes, you are an authority and you can tell someone when they have German pride? <laughs> but it's you know it is a battle, and I would definitely also welcome your pummeling on this issue because I think it's an energy field that I cannot really get out of my system by myself, and. Uh, can you get um, macrobiotic counseling uh, for the balance of your yin and yang energies? Because you're, you're, you tend to be more yin than yang. Yes. And, uh, but you can be a very strong yin mm -hmm. with, by the right foods that, that are strong yin. Okay. And, and you can become very well balanced and you don't have to consider being yin as a major handicap. Mm -hmm. You just have to know how and what to eat and how to take care of your body. I have been working just recently on it, and uh, I actually have been getting a little bit too young. It's very hard for me to stay yin enough to be balanced and young enough to be strong enough. Do you do you eat cooked uh, root vegetables? I eat all the vegetables they have on the line. I eat a lot of that. Do they make a lot of root vegetables? Sometimes mixed in with other vegetables. Maybe I should make more for myself. Well, root vegetables are extremely calming to the mm -hmm. to the body and the psyche. Mm -hmm. And they also take care of the colon, and colon cancer in the United States is, is one of the leading causes of death. Mm -hmm. And um, your, your colon lines are from here to here, right here. This is colon. Some people have no lines, some people have very deep lines. Okay, thank you. Good evening. I'd like to share a tip with you that I just picked up in reading a wonderful book. It's uh, called Smart Moves by Carla Hannaford. She's a neurophysiologist, and she goes into the development of learning as tied uh, to the body and movement. I have been doing, as a teacher, brain gym in the classroom, and um, it's hard to be objective, but I think I see results. Working with children, I also have to deal with their occasional angers that come up, and you, you try to coach them and help them through it the best you can. But she gave an interesting uh, a perspective on this. Apparently, when a person is angry, adrenaline is released. And the particular brain gym uh, exercise called hookups connects parts of the brain where the excessive flow of adrenaline stops then. So in her work with adolescents, she has the, the two-minute rule, she called it, and she has the children put themselves in a hookup position and will not allow them to talk for two minutes or two to five minutes. And during this time, she feels that it does help them calm down so they can deal with their anger. So I wanted to share this wish with you in case you have the opportunity to assist a child or yourself or anyone who is receptive. And that move, if you're not familiar with it, is... You can do this, by the way, in sitting or lying position or standing. But you would cross, for instance, the right leg over the left, cross the left arm over the right, and then bring your hands up. And then if you wish, you could do it in the opposite position, left leg over the right, right arm over the left, and bring your arms up. I've also read in another book, it's good to help you relax to sleep as well. So I'm looking forward to trying this with my students uh, at these times when they're dealing with anger to see if it'll help them. I would like to see put into our classroom um, having available each time anger comes up is the count to nine decree. Mm -hmm. And the children know it by heart. And if you want to do a brain gym to it, with it, mm -hmm. just as you're doing it, 
but for them to feel ultimate esteem that they can be in God control of themselves is a wonderful thing to start out at a very young age. It's, it's just so uplifting to feel that you can be in control of your energy and not misqualify it and then have to deal with karma. They do love that decree, but we do need to do it more. Thank you. Do, do you do any exercise along with it? Or, we, you, or I, you just say it? Usually we just say it, but it would be good to combine it. You might, you might find uh, something that they, since children need a lot of exercise and movement, you, you might find a good way to, to combine it. It takes their attention off it too. What do you do then at the point where all, all this is done and then whoever the two protagonists are in the, <laughs> in the room or antagonists are, uh, are still angry at each other? That's a difficult part, but I try to let them speak and be sure that I keep in a very calm voice and a calm tone and recognize each of them as having the opportunity to express to me what the problem is and for me not to be judgmental in that moment, not to come down with a discipline like this, but, but to allow them the opportunity to speak freely so they can express without, um, without being fearful what to grade, work it What out. grade are your children? This is the fourth grade. How about if, if the, after the count to nine and whatever you're going to do, you ask them to sit down and write out what um, what was the problem? Where they see themselves at fault? Where was the other one at fault? How did it begin to escalate? And let them just write a little essay and continue teaching them how to come down off their anger. That would be excellent. And some, what I find, and I'm sure we've all seen this in children, if you divert their attention <laughs> to something right. else constructive, they'll forget about it. One thing I have discovered in using the uh, Patricia Wells techniques with children to uh, try to assist them to go through the proper steps of polite interactions, social skills, is that we've worked on it so hard that I realize some of the children think that they can use this social skill to tell anybody anything they think is wrong with them. And so I had to back off of that and show them that just because you know the proper steps to do and telling somebody that you're disagreeing with them that doesn't mean you always have the right to just come and tell them everything either that we just need to let some things pass by put it into the flame and not react either so we're uh, I, I found and you that you need to tell them that that's perception. the definition of grace yes. being gracious is to overlook another's faults that's my definition mm -hmm. of being gracious we just you know we just don't dwell on it we just move on so it's coming in. I found my own teaching techniques. It's now kind of swung one way and now trying to bring it into balance for them. Thank you. Hi. Hello, Mother. I'm going to try and say this without crying. <laughs> I feel get very guilty for being unkind. You know that I love the children, and sometimes I'm unkind. <laughs> and I would like you to tell me, if you can, a key that I need to be more kind. Do you have a photograph of yourself at five or six? Yes. Would you be unkind to that little girl? No. Um, Have you, have you gone to any of our therapists to talk about why you feel the need to be unkind? Because Is it because someone else was unkind to you or parents were harsh? I haven't talked about that specifically. When you came up, I was going to tell you that this unkindness goes back to a previous life. I, all of the work that I've done in therapy, I have felt that very strongly because you know my parents in this life, and you know I've had very loving parents in this life. And so I've, I've felt that often that these hurts that I feel that come up in the inner child work are from previous lives. So then we know that someone was cruel to you. Mm -hmm. 
do we need to be cruel to someone else to get even? No. Then, if we're not in a place where we can control ourselves, we have to bite our lip and do our count to nine internally. It's like sometimes we get caught like in the trap of a past life and we just can't resolve it on the spot. And for all the world, we wouldn't want to put it on these, these children. So if you have another teacher in the class or if you just turn around and drink a full glass of water. It's very balancing. And just know that this is something you have to conquer. And so your key is to self-observe. Keep observing yourself. Okay. And be one step ahead of yourself. So you beat yourself to it, <laughs> you know. You already yeah. are calmed down before you open your mouth to say an unkind word. Thank you very much, Mother. Good evening, Mother. Uh, yes, I do want to be pummeled. And I wanted to bring up a, a problem with trust. I seem to have, I'm more aware of it than I have been, that I'm not trusting either the masters, I'm not trusting you, although it embarrasses me to even think that way. But it has been, I think, a pattern, obviously, coming from childhood, and perhaps many embodiments as well, what I want to do is get a sense of where I go in overcoming this and putting it behind me and filling it with the love and trust that I want to have. Mark, so, Mark Prophet said two things. Mm -hmm. He said, trust no man. Mm -hmm. And he meant no woman either. Because mm -hmm. you can't trust the human consciousness. Oh, that's right. So, excuse me. false alarm <laughs> but you turn and you look at you look at the dollar bill and it says in God we trust mm -hmm. and Mark was always saying that trust no man and I'm just adding on to it in God we trust so why don't you reinforce your trust in God and then you will begin to reinforce your trust in the Holy Christ self of each person and instead of uh, having to deal with the ups and downs of the human consciousness, you will be in contact with the solid bedrock of that one's holy Christ self and render a great person, a great service to that person without having to decide, do I trust this person or don't I trust this person? Obviously, we have nine gifts of the Holy Spirit and we, we have to exercise our discernments, discernment of spirits. But I, but I believe really trusting in, in the, the Atman within the person you're talking to, the Buddha, the seed of the Buddha, that, that you are communicating with the Holy Christ Self. Sometimes when I'm, I'm looking at people that I'm talking to, um, I am visualizing the beauty of their seamless garment, their Christ Self over them. And the whole immaculate concept that I can give them as a gift because I'm having a conversation of a few paragraphs with them. Mm -hmm. And so I'm listening to what they're saying to me. But I want, I want to reinforce their, their reality, their real self. And so that's what I'm looking at when they're talking to me. Now, you may be, I think you're seeing a lack of trust that I have towards other people. But I thought my problem was lack of trust toward the masters. If is which way is it, or is it both, and will they be interconnected? The absence of trust reflects in all relationships. Mm -hmm. I see. So no. that's why to cure the problem of mistrust, mm -hmm. we go to the place where we know trust is absolutely dependable. El Mori is absolutely dependable. Saint Germain is absolutely dependable. So we place our trust in them, and then they guide us in dealing with people. Mm -hmm. And we visualize the good in people, but we also have to be careful. I think you have more trust than you think you have. I know I have areas of trust. Um, what are your areas of trust? 
actually, I would have thought I trusted people more than you're describing. Uh, I thought I, you told me you trusted. People. No, it's the lack of trust in yourself. I think that's where it starts. That's where it starts. The self you trust in has to be your Holy Christ self. Mm -hmm. And none of us can, we can't deny that our Holy Christ self is a being of, a, of the cosmic honor flame. So we can say whatever we want to say to our Holy Christ self, it's confidential, and we know that we can trust the Holy Christ self. It's not wise to trust one's human consciousness because the human consciousness constantly changes its mind. Mm -hmm. Okay, I will work on that. Thank you very much. Hi, Mother. Hi. Um, I'm sure you're aware of this situation, but I wanted to share it with the staff as well. On Saturday, <laughs> on Saturday, I walked into the bathroom talking, and um, later on it was pointed out to me by a friend that I had passed you, walked past you, walked in the same stall, came back out, and she said to me that she had overheard you mention a few comments about my, my uh, chatter. So when she told me that, um, I, felt, I felt something deep down inside saying, oh, you know, she's so right. I do partake in excessive chatter, and I know that there's a lot of light and a lot of energy that I lose just, you know, and part of that, I'm sure, is because I'm... Uh, way too yin for my own good. But um, the, the thing that really bothered me was that you could walk by me and, um, and I, I, might not, I, didn't even, I didn't even notice you. I was so wrapped up in whatever I was talking about in myself and my thoughts that I didn't even notice your presence. And I think that there's a, there's a lot of things that, that pass before me that I'm just dense to. And the whole reason why um, we wanted to have this discussion was tell us the little things, tell us the little things that we can work on that are so subtle that just pass right before us. And I guess that's what I'm asking you. If, you know, there are three things, hopefully it's not a laundry list long, but, you know, <laughs> three or more <laughs> things that, you know, you can tell me that, you know, I can work on and, and hopefully it's going to okay, be well, benefiting. You need to be a little bit more to the yang side. Oh, I know that. And you're, you're, well, that but you can do that. <clears throat> okay. And, and then you will, ch you will chatter less. But when I walked by you, I picked up on the chatter entity. So mm -hmm. I asked someone, does she chatter a lot? <laughs> and they said, yeah, she chatters a lot. Mm -hmm. So I said, oh, no. <laughs> because I, I like to be silent and commune, you know. So I, I don't think that I... I have to tell you how to change to perfect yourself. I think you are very capable of seeing and deciding you're going to center yourself. Mm -hmm. and, and that will come along. Okay. But are there other, I mean, are there anything that, are there things that you have witnessed to me or anyone else in the community, I guess is what I'm asking, that you can tell us? Like, what are these little things that, you know, we were talking about even before we got into this big discussion, just well, the little things that pass Excessive by. chatter is a major challenge. Yeah. I don't need to give you four or five more things. If okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've got my work set out for me then, I guess. I mean, I think I talk too much. You know, as much as I thoughtfully don't talk, I still think that I waste time talking. And I'm, I'm very short when I'm on the phone, too. I mean, I, I want to hear it now, and I want to hear it in brief, and thank you. you know, so no, I, th I think we can, all, we can all conserve a tremendous amount of energy for the victory of our ascension. After all, a certain part of our energy every day should be going to the weaving of our deathless solar body and the weaving of our pathway that, get, that, that will take us all the way back to the octaves of light. So... Most people don't have to worry about that in this world. What we expend in conversation and chatter that is totally needless, we are not putting toward the tremendous strength we need in that deathless solar body. What is a deathless solar body? Thinking, think of the wording of it. The deathless solar body means that 
It's a body that we will step into, and when we step into it, we will be deathless. We will have our immortality. But we are shorn lambs, so we don't have that deathless solar body now. So we have to go about mending the holes, the rents in our garment. But we have to have some energy left over every day to put into this, this seamless garment, which is the deathless solar body. So what does that tell us? It's deathless. It relates to the sun and the great central sun of Alpha and Omega, deathless solar body. So by the time we come that far and we're ready to make our ascension, this physical body is also being transformed and we are going to be entering into our ascended master light bodies. So we have the obligation to set aside every day a certain quotient of energy that we can put toward that ascension. Who's going to make our ascension for us? Who's going to weave this deathless solar body? Who's going to, who's going to put the plugs in the holes where we have holes in our garments, which are like flaws or tears in our garment, our four lower bodies? We have to do it. No ascended master is going to take that on for us. So if we want to make our ascension and we allow ourselves to consume energy from morning till night, talking or whatever, I think we should be concerned. I think we should have in store and waiting for us that, that, that deathless solar body that we're supposed to be weaving. There's a Keeper of the Flame lesson on it. You might want to look it up and, and read it again. But it's our vehicle. We're not going to get there by you know, the space shuttle. We're not going to get there by rockets, by aliens, by anything. You know? We're not going to get out of this universe without having woven our deathless solar body. And, and I know people who are chilas who still have holes in their garments. And I remember someone uh, t telling me this on staff that I was very impressed with. And, and this person told me that he knew that he had rents in his garment. And as a result of that, uh, he decided to become celibate even though he was married because he was so concerned about how many holes he had in his garment and he wanted that garment to be sealed. That, that was quite something for somebody to tell me that, who was a family man and, and, and certainly in his prime and so forth. But I can tell you that the Ascended Masters have all, all gone through it. So, well, you know, let's be thinking about this these days. Let's be thinking about that deathless solar body. You see, the catch is, is our physical body going to give out before we finish building the deathless solar body? Then what happens? So there are a lot of things to get ready for. Name, number one, our wedding. We're, we're going to get married to God pretty soon. So, you know, there's only so much energy in a day. That's the thing. So it's like spending money to spend it wisely. This Thank has been a much. wonderful session. Thank you for concluding it. And it's very wonderful to see all of you. And I hope that this has put you on a certain tack, uh, which should be to want to clear up everything from the old year or even many years before that you can remember in your lifetime or past lives. It's, it's great to enter the new year feeling that, that great cleanness and please come into it with a centered position so that you don't lose your light because of what you ate. And let's have fun fasting together. And it's, it's just wonderful being on the path together. I'm, I'm very grateful to know all of you. I'm sorry my back is over here. I hope you change sides once in a while. <laughs> so let us uh, seal this event. Beloved, mighty I am presence from the heart of God in the great central sun. We know that thou art God and that the strong tie we have to your heart is that place where we will ascend to at the conclusion of this life, God willing. We call then for our holy Christ selves to remind us, to give us 
those points of self-observation, to not overlook the little things that destroy us, but to conquer whether the greater or the lesser of our burdens. I call for right livelihood, right action, tremendous compassion on the part of my staff and all light bearers of the world. I call to you, beloved Holy Christ selves of us and our I am presence and to our beloved El Moria. We thank you for sponsoring us, El Moria. We do not know what we would do without you. So then we love to serve you. We are grateful for this place. We call then in our prayers in your behalf, beloved El Moria, for the exposure by Lanello and K-17 of terrorism now and through the next years coming, of burdens upon the planet that we might assist you in alleviating. Beloved El Moria, make known to us in dictations or in our own inner minds how we can help you more right now and in the days and years coming. Thank you for this opportunity for us to help you bear your burden. We pray that your God victory will also be ours and that the victory of the planet will ascend and that what we do for you, we do for Saint Germain and all ascended hosts. So our dearly beloved, we will write our notes to you and burn them tonight if we wish, just so that we can tell you how much, how deeply we love for you. We love you and we care for you. Beloved Master, call on us. We are waiting for your instructions. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and the Divine Mother, Amen. Thank you, everyone.